Well, good morning, everybody. Hello. My name's Ken, um, and I've got a short talk today to talk about um, some work we did on the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid SUV. Now, um, the good news is, is right now this vehicle is not shipping in the US. I believe it ships in the fall this year, but we've got about 100,000 of these across Europe and Asia, so they're everywhere. Um, I really, really wanted to bring the vehicle with me, uh, but it wouldn't fit in my check baggage, unfortunately, so you've got to put up with my videos, I'm afraid. Um, it's not a long talk. It's a ridiculously simple hack. It's not complicated. Um, I hope that you will be as surprised as I was when we found these bugs. Um, just blew my mind. Anyway, that, that is my vehicle. Um, those aren't my plates, I might add, unsurprisingly. Um, a little bit of background, who are we? So uh, we're a company called Pentest Partners, clues in the name, we're Pentesters, unsurprisingly. Um, back in the day, I, I'm really into uh, electric vehicles, um, and a, a buddy of mine took delivery of a BMW i3 about two years ago, and then got an i8 about a year ago, which is an awesome vehicle. I love it, absolutely love it. Um, you've probably seen various issues with BMW Connected Drive, their, their mobile application. Um, we found one the first couple of years ago. Uh, it was an issue to do with uh, the way that iRemote, which is the mobile app for uh, the iSeries vehicles, is, is configured. And there was an issue to do with the way you could force password resets, temporary passwords that are brute forceable. You could provision a new version of the mobile app. You could geolocate the vehicle. You could pop the locks. And then you're on. Um, about a year ago, they had another issue where it was shown that... Um, the communications were done plain text, that was all fixed. And I don't know if you saw last week, there was another issue published, really interesting vulnerability to do with um, uh, enumerating VIN numbers. Anyway, there we go. Um, I want to tell you about the, the, the mobile app. So um, this is the mobile app for my vehicle. Um, you can do some stuff with it. Uh, the, the key function of it is to set up a charging schedule. So if you've got an electric vehicle, you want to charge it on cheaper electricity overnight, you can use the application and say, right, we'll charge between midnight and 5 a.m., which back home, that's when we get cheap rate electricity, which is really cool. So my car is half the price to charge up. You can also, um, you can turn on the AC in the morning. So if you're on a hot day, cool it off. But if you live in the UK, you need the heat in the morning because it's freezing and raining. But there you go. Um, it does some other stuff too. Um, What's really unusual is the way that the mobile application connects to the vehicle. So if you have a smart vehicle, you have a mobile application for it, you'd probably talk to it using an API, using cellular data, or maybe Wi-Fi. This is different. It uses Wi-Fi to talk directly to an access point on the vehicle. And that's really unusual. I don't know, has anyone else seen another vehicle that works like this? It's the first one I've seen. I cannot find another one that does this. There is an AP on the vehicle the mobile app talks directly to the vehicle over Wi-Fi. That's really, really unusual. And that got me interested. Um, I genuinely was in the parking lot at my kid's school. This is, I didn't make this up. Genu and I, I, had, I was looking for some Wi-Fi, and I saw an unusual access point name pop up. I thought, whoa, what's, that? what's going on there? I spoke to a, a buddy of mine who kind of looked roughly where as the car went past. He said, yeah, that's my car. I was like, what? You have an access point on your car? I said, yeah, yeah, it's really cool. So, in order to talk, yeah, is, it, is that working, guys? One, two, one, two. It's a bit, a bit crusty. Okay, I'll speak up, shall I? <laughs> yeah, one, two, one, two. Yeah, can we get some more gain on that, guys? No, nope, maybe not. Shall I just shout? Yeah, that's much better. Good. Okay. So, what's some really weird? It's big an access point. It's encrypted. It has an SSID. It has a pre-share key. What a surprise! In order to connect to it, that um, PSK is printed on a piece of paper in O's <laughs> <laughs> oh! Okay. What's really weird is the SSID you can change in the field, although that function doesn't actually work, and in theory you can change it. The pre-share key cannot be changed. <laughs> so if you want to change hardware, the bit you can change, cut your card, it just doesn't work. Um, and that's factory set, and you know, I've looked at this and so, said, whoa, there's, there's some trouble here, we need to start looking at this. Um, so the SSID format is straightforward, it's the way remote, in capital letters, you then have two numbers, four letters, <coughs> it doesn't matter so much. The scary bit is the pre-shared key format, it is four lowercase alpha, it is six digits. And the char set for lowercase alpha is uh, 21 characters, not 26. And that was really... Quick to crack. So we captured the handshake, we cracked it, 
Um, we used some uh, 970s, we've got four of those in rig, and that practice for two and a half days. Um, we're building a bigger rig at the moment with 16, um, 16 GPUs, that's going to go real quick, but if you're in a hurry, you can just upload it to someone like AWS. We, we calculated the cost as being around $1,000. That's a lot of money, but this is a $40,000 vehicle. Right, it's expensive. That's kind of a trade I, I think I'd go for, actually. Um, we're connected to it. Really unusual. So um, it has a static IP address 192.168.846. Port 80 is there, but there's no service running. I don't know what that's for. I can't figure that out. Um, but TCP port 8080 is open, and that's what we got. So you can retrieve the VIN. As you can see, that's disclosed there. You can also see the SSID of the vehicle. That's not my car. Um, and there's some other stuff in there as well. I promise you it's not. <laughs> uh, pretty obviously a binary protocol. It's a game stand Wi-Fi module. Uh, very, very popular module. Really interesting and quite, quite good fun. So, Wireshark, what do we do? So, um, hopefully that's gonna work. There we go. So we, man in the middle of the connection, we sniffed making some requests. In this particular case, we, um, we were actually turning on the lights. So let's follow that. Uh, duh, duh, oh, wrong one. Duh, 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 duh. And you get a bunch of junk. But of course, being a binary protocol, stuff into a hex dump, and you get a load of interesting data. Um, very, very um, verbose uh, messaging. So the red is the vehicle talking to the mobile application, the blue is the mobile application responding back again. It, it's really hard. I mean, we first wanted to fuzz this and see what we could do, but it'll only pretty much stand up for one message every 15 seconds or so. The entire vehicle status, as far as we can work out, goes to the application, then the entire status goes back again. So it's really slow. So we started playing around with this, had a bit of a look, and started seeing messaging popping up. Now, this particular one, we were, um, we, the only uh, function we ran was just uh, this turn on the lights. And that's a function of your mobile application. It's quite useful. If you want to find your vehicle in a car park or it's dark or in a driveway, um, the only slight challenge with this is it only works when you're in Wi Fi range. It's not like it's selling your data on the Wi Fi and API where you can turn on anywhere in the world. You can only do it when you're in Wi Fi range. And I don't know if you've ever mislaid your vehicle in a parking lot. By the time you're close enough for Wi Fi, you're there anyway, right? I don't know. Um, so we started having a bit of a play around with this, um, and we did the classics, so um, we chopped up the packet, we replayed, we chopped it again, worked out which function, which part of the PCAP was, um, was actually uh, making it work, and we finally got down to a point where we could successfully, make a noise, um, start to analyze what the packets were doing. So the messages that were being sent to explain these, so um, it's all there pretty straightforward. Uh, the bit that threw us a moment for a while was actually some of the messaging is six bytes and some of it is seven bytes. That really threw us. We were really struggling to make any progress with this. Um, send that bunch, add a checksum. So it's, it's really easy once you can understand how the protocol works. It's just not rocket science. So if you want to have some fun, capture the key, crack the key, send six bytes and I have video of this because I couldn't bring the vehicle with me and this happens um, so we're no longer replaying we're just talking to the direct car and the lights come on okay so what it's the lights okay it's an electric vehicle we're going to start draining the battery a little bit so what you know it's just lights right um, so then we started uh, having a quick look at the uh, the mobile application um, got it over here went in the Android version come on there you go and started seeing how some more of the functionality was working we've done it by replay we've every, already achieved everything we wanted to um, but now you can start having a bit of a look through so that class tells you how to uh, construct the messages the interesting bit is down here you can start getting sorry the resolution's a bit crazy um, you can start seeing the various functions here so these are sort of the commands the, the values you need to send that will uh, trigger various um, actions on the vehicle so it has a battery heater for dry battery so when it's cold you can um, heat the battery up to make it run more efficiently but there's loads and loads of other fun stuff in there um, we've had some issues with some, making some of these work but the, the commands that are quite interesting are these ko kickoff um, you can see start seeing AC, uh, you can start seeing your charge presets, and that, that's where things get quite good fun. Um, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo, where have I gone? There you go. Um, and that was the one that got us interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
What, what could possibly go wrong at this point, right? <laughs> um, so, as I said at the beginning, this is about playing around with the, um, the charging schedules. That's the primary focus of the application. So you could drive up someone's car, you could uh, hack the Wi-Fi key, and then turn on the AC. So when their vehicle's left on their driveway, run the AC permanently, and then you get down there. And believe me, it's really, really annoying when you forget to charge your electric vehicle in the morning. It's a real problem. Okay, it's a hybrid, so you can still go somewhere, but I really like electric cars. Um, you have to put up with my crazy video, I'm afraid. This is one we recorded. So I want to show you this. Keep an eye on the hazard lights here. You can see, I'm just, see the lights are actually flashing there, so the alarm is on. Okay? The showing the alarm is working. The interior volumetric theft alarm is operational. The only thing I cheated with there a little bit was I wound the window down. Because otherwise, every time I do this demo, I have to replace my driver's side window glass. <laughs> kind of awkward. So um, that's operating as it should do. However, if you send it that, seven bytes, um, and this happens. That's all you need to send it, guys. Watch the uh, hazard lights there. See they're not going off. And the crazy bit is, unless you've deadlocked the vehicle, you can reach in and pop the door. Okay, so we've now deactivated the theft alarm for a vehicle over Wi-Fi. Now the next place we've got to do some, quite a lot of work to do on this. Um, so you've now got access to the onboard diagnostics port. So the next step was to uh, code the new key. Just because the Wi-Fi key was too short. Um, we coded this up into a nice Python script, so it's all there. And if you want to redo <laughs> this, you know. Um, now, we, uh, at the same time as disclosing this, we also disclosed a fix. Okay, it's a really, really easy fix for this, okay? So if you go to the uh, mobile application, we put cancel in registration there, and what that does, once the access point in the vehicle has no more Wi-Fi pairings, has no more associations, it powers down. And in order to re-enable it, you have to press the remote key button 10 times. And that brings it back to a parameter. So it's really, really easy to fix this. There's another way that Mitsubishi published, which you have to press the remote key 30 times, and that has the same effect. I like my version, it's quicker anyway. Um, the other fun thing about this is because it uses Wi Fi, it's terrible. And of course, if you only use Wiggle.net, the water driving database, you can go and find the vehicles. So this is the UK. As I said, these aren't shipping in the USA right now. Um, but that's UK. There are about 22, 23,000 of these vehicles on the road right now. And I had a query on Wiggle and found 6,000 hits of these vehicles parked on people's driveways. Yeah? Now that makes things quite different, doesn't it? It means you can find the vehicle, you know it's vulnerable, you drive to it, you capture the handshake, you come back a bit later having cracked the key, and you take the vehicle. Now, we did some, some fun here analysis here. So we analyzed for three weeks before we disclosed. That's that lot. And then we analyzed the three-week window after disclosure, and still 400 people had left the Wi-Fi enabled on their Outlanders. Wow! So you're still disclosing exactly how to hack these vehicles. Go and find a car, crack the key, disable the alarm, steal the car. Wow! That's just nuts. Um, longer term, so um, there is a function in, in the mobile app. You can actually update the firmware for the vehicle. And that's the firmware, just uh, unzip it. Um, it's got very little debug information in, so I haven't spent much time looking at this, but there's a bunch of strings there. You can see how it's uh, creating the Wi-Fi connection. I, th I think the PSK is derived in here. I'm not sure how yet. We're working on that right now. Um, I'm quite concerned, though, that in order to fix this bug, you're asking the consumer to download an update to their mobile app, connect to it over Wi-Fi, and push the firmware update to the vehicle. And one thing that concerns me is this Wi-Fi connection is quite unstable. It drops out and that's just what we're using normally. The level only when you try and push the firmware update to something. I find that just a little bit scary. And I don't know, but <laughs> if that firmware update went wrong, I'd have quite an expensive brick sat on my driveway. I don't know about you. <laughs> um, I'll let you know how we get on with the firmware, but it's, it's in the mobile application there. Um, I want to talk about disclosure because this is a bit of a train wreck. Um, we always disclose responsibly. And that's what we're about. So we made contact, disclosed process, we made the contact, we've um, had a uh, central conversation with the in the UK, um, we sent them all the stuff we found, said, so, yeah, here you go, go fix, have a chat with us, whatever. And um, we spoke to them, we got no response, we spoke to them 10 days later, and I, I've never had such a weird phone conversation in my life. They said they'd had no reports of this anywhere in the world, and therefore didn't consider it to be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> 
which, which I, was, I was blown away. I mean, you know, I'm not sweet as often, but that's one of those times. Um, so I, I said to the guy, I said, well, look, now our only other option is to go and speak to you know, the security press you know, to try and see what their view is. And I said, we all say the same to the press as we said to you. Okay. <laughs> Fine. You just give me carte blanche to speak to the press. So I did. And I spoke to the BBC, and um, now Mitsubishi think it's a very serious issue and are working, <laughs> in fairness, really hard now, actually. That, um, as soon as um, I think they realised they actually was a bigger issue than they thought, um, we were invited down to Mitsubishi to do a They got a car off the line, um, brand new, loads of software, and they said everything, and the attack worked on that as well. So um, they've actually been really good since. I think the reason they had a, um, a bit of a fail there was because. Um, when we disclosed them, it turned out subsequently to be the same time as the emission scandal broke. Um, I kind of wonder if they had a bit of a break there, but still no excuse not to deal with the security risk question. Uh, well, that's a good question. I'll follow up on that. I didn't go, it wasn't as thorough as you were, but it wasn't like But I did some kind of slide and comments with the Finnish representative of the institution around the same time as you did. I'm not sure of the exact date. Um, the thing I got is that the corporate structure of Mitsubishi and then the country's representatives is that when they kind of head office that the people who actually designed the car probably never got involved at that point. So, you know, it's probably got lost somewhere. Yes, I, I do know that Mitsubishi UK did speak to HQ in Japan. I'm just not sure if they really pass on what we said. I think there's maybe some, some filtering going on there. I'm not sure. Yeah, great. You found the same thing too. That, that's awesome. Um, you know, we, we know what disclosure should have happened. You know, they, they should have said, "Yeah, that's great. Send us everything." We go and you know, show them what the problem is. They fix it, and we only disclose afterwards. I wish that had happened. I really do. Um, there's still lots of stuff we've got to work on. We found the module in the end. That took a lot of finding, actually. It's, it's, it's tucked away um, behind the trunk liner. Uh, it's a costal body network control module. Usually these have GSM modules in, but unusually this has got a GameStan Wi-Fi module. So we spent some time having a look at the connections between that module and the CAN, um, the stuff I'm going at the moment, that will be disclosed to, to Mitsubishi, obviously. Um, there is lots of extra functionality in the mobile application that's not used. So for example, there is door lock control. So you could pop the doors potentially, but we can't figure out how to make that go at the moment. We've just run out of time. Um, the other crazy bit as well is, is the mobile app, it really is a bit, uh, a bit flaky. Um, and you know, you know like you're supposed to store sensitive data and stuff in a keychain or look after it, like the OS provides. This is stored in an unencrypted SQLite database in the mobile app. Great. <laughs> um, and there's some unexpected functions as well. We found that one. Change gun status. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally need to find where that is on my vehicle. <laughs> it's, it's very James Bond, I'm sure. Um, but just yeah, to wrap up, guys, you know, we've been doing this for long year, a long time. Our, our background is actually an industrial control system in Scala. Um, and actually, it, it translated quite nicely into vehicles and some of the other crazy stuff we've done and are doing. You might remember the work we did in the Wi Fi tea kettle last year. We hacked the IoT fridge last year and are already working on their uh, like smart fridge this year. Um, one well, of the crazy things came out, we were asked to help CSI Cyber write a hack script, and that didn't go well, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Uh, we also do quite a bit of work in automotive as well. Um, the big challenge you usually have is, you know, how do you get hold of the vehicles to have a good go and get something useful? Um, anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. We tweet about this all the time. Do follow. Our blog's there. Everything's written up there. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Did you ever consider developing a third-party app and selling it to make a little bit of money? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> a great idea, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I think it's probably better to work with the vendors, isn't it? Yeah, there's probably more in there. <laughs> How do you choose back from locations if no other product is meant to work? I'm sorry, is that again? Oh, how do you find the vehicle? Okay, so this relies upon um, war drivers going out there and geolocating the vehicles. So there's always a lag. So you know. You might see the vehicle on the road, but it, you know, it's moved by the time you, you see it update on Wiggle. But when it's parked at someone's house, it's highly likely it's going to be there next time you drive by in the evening. So yeah, it, it's obviously Wiggle takes time to update. Um, although that said, my vehicle was located at a, a, a trade show at a booth in London, and it had been there 24 hours. So yeah, it was, it was pretty nuts. There's another question. Yeah. Have you tried the same thing on moving vehicles? On moving vehicles. That's what I want to do next. Yeah, and it's, it's obviously you need quite a few people. You need someone driving both cars, and yeah, we, we believe it works. What's the question? Uh, so whether have we tried this on a moving vehicle? 
Um, the answer is no, um, although it was a good um, So yeah, like very much like Charlie Miller and Chris Carter said, you know, we want to do the cheapest speed next. But until we reach the can, probably not so. But they have to be in the wide wide range. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to be right back there. How did you get the Java? How did we get the? How did you get the Java? Without APK. Sorry. Just APK. Oh. I think JD, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah JADX or JD, but that'll do the job for you. Uh, how much time did you spend there? Sorry? How much time did you spend How much time? So, uh, probably about a week in total spread over a couple of months. Yeah, so it wasn't a big, complicated, time consuming hack. It was really easy. Uh, do you think the reason they have a fixed PSK, uh, ESCO, is something deeper than they just too lazy? Maybe they use ESCO for something else? So, uh, there's probably a, a deeper question there actually, which is why use Wi Fi? And I believe the reason is, is it's a heck of a lot cheaper than setting up a GSM connection, an API, servers. It's just much cheaper, I think, just to have a Wi Fi module connect direct. So, I think given that this was done in terms of cost, I think the answer to your question was probably it's done in terms of cost as well. It would have been more expensive to code up a method of updating the PSK. So you'd be having to push updates into the module, and I think that would have cost more money. So I think it's a question of cost, frankly. I'm terribly sorry because I've lost your legs, I couldn't find it. So this may be a repetitious question, but the app is the reason why you're calling is that just directly related to the mission is yeah. Yeah, yeah, so if you just go and search the Play Store for Inventec or Mitsubishi, you'll, you'll get that hit straight away. Have you tried any other vehicles or just Mitsubishi? Well, that's, that's, that's the thing. Is we've, we've only really looked at this because it was obvious Wi-Fi. I, I haven't found any more vehicles that actually use Wi-Fi for the interface between the, the, the smart application and the vehicle. Everything else goes through you know, an API. So the answer to the question is no, because I haven't found another one that does. But if you do, please tell me. Actually, some cars do it. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, it's limited. So it's like a multimedia system, but it contains some common material. Cool. Yeah. I'd really like to know about that. <laughs> really like to know about that. Thank you. Um, like for the app, do they have also like login information? Uh, no. But what I mean is that is there a login for the app? No. No? No. There is the function. You can put a pin in front of the application, but that's actually very easy to bypass. Yeah. <laughs> So there is, there is no auth. Because there's no API. Right. But there's yeah. a pin, right? If you set it one up, yeah. For the, yeah. So there's a second pin you can enable in the cell phone application. So, like, there's, so after you extract the APK, yeah. like, is, there a, it's, um, is there a chance that the pin will also be stored? Don't know. I've never looked, actually. Yeah, yeah because yeah. I've seen a lot of like, apps too for cars where they store usernames and password. OK. Yeah. yeah, I've so never seen that. I think maybe there's also a chance that they store things. Yeah, that's yeah. a good thought, yeah. Have on, some, the, some on the shared graphs. Yeah. Because, like, they remember. Mm, that's a good thought. Yeah, thank you. Good. Question here. Sorry, man, I didn't understand. How, how are these, how is the mobile lab from a legit owner joined to not, 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 not by a bunch of others? How are the credentials changed, like, so that the legit owner <laughs> okay. can talk to this without, you know, you had to break that key. Like, I didn't get how that, that associated. There isn't. There is no further authentication to the vehicle. Right. It's the PSK, and that is it. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It's, once you've cracked the key, you've got the car. But how does the consumer I mean, but there isn't, so they, they get the key in the manual, so it's printed in the, in the owner's manual. Oh, it's unique to that car. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you do have to crack a key per vehicle, yeah, quite, yeah. Yeah, but there is no further off, I know, crazy. Cool, any more questions? Guys, if anyone you know, wants to say anything urgent, I'll be in the IoT village for the next two days working on the fridge, so maybe see you there. Thank you. <laughs>